Isaiah chapter number 42. Portrait of Jesus Christ tonight is Jesus Christ, the servant of Jehovah, or the servant of the Lord, the servant of God. Jesus Christ, the servant. I was reading this this morning, and uh, just as I was going through it, the thought, you know, it's just, just an amazing thought to read about it. Isaiah, you know, written uh, some 700 B.C., and uh, in that time frame, and predicting the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But to think of Christ as a servant. And when I went online and uh, looked at a few things, and, and quite a few people had some struggles. I was surprised how many people were asking the question about uh, how can he be the servant and a son? How can he be both at the same time? I, I, that's never bothered me. I guess I've never struggled with wondering how, but um, I guess quite a few questions came up and uh, how Jesus could be both a servant and a son. Is he, is he a servant or a son? Right? And that's, that's kind of the idea that he couldn't be both. <laughs> my, my, my boys are like, no, I'm a servant sometimes <laughs> and a son. And I don't you know, when I was with my dad, there's times you felt like a servant. Amen? But you never stop being a son. Jesus Christ was the son of God. And that points to his deity. We'll look at a few verses tonight. And, uh, and then, as a servant of God, would definitely point as to his humanity, as he came to be a servant of God. Look at Isaiah 42. Beautiful portion of scripture. Father, bless the reading of thy word. Open our hearts tonight. Help us to stand in awe of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the servant. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, Behold my servant. I, and right there, that kind of, I stopped there this morning, and I'm like, that's kind of what we're doing on Wednesday nights, right? Let's stop and take a closer look at the Son of God. I hope, hope you never get bored doing that. You know, as you get more needs, as you guys get a little older, some of you teenagers, you probably, you know, you really haven't been through the big ones yet, you know, and uh, the times when you need God a lot more. And the older you get, the more you get through things. And uh, um, studying Jesus Christ will mean more and more and more to you the older you get. And uh, teens are volatile years. And your heart goes way up and way down. And I know it means a lot to you now, but boy, I tell you, the older you get, the more, the more you'll want to study Jesus Christ, the more he'll mean to you. Behold my servant. God wants you to take a closer look at this. He says, whom I uphold, mine elect. You know there's a lot of elect in the Bible. You might want to study the elect angels, Israel's elect, the Lord Jesus Christ here is elect. What's it mean to be elect? And uh, you might want to study that doctrine. It is a big Bible doctrine. Um, I don't agree with our Reformed brethren on what election is. I don't believe there's an election to heaven, an election to hell. Uh, I don't believe that. I was told by a preacher who's quite a bit older than me, been in ministry 45 years, said, you'll never find where the Bible says only the elect go to heaven. So I've been studying that. And the nearest I can tell, he's right. The Bible never says only the elect go to heaven. Oh, that was a kind of a good insight. Yeah, research it. See what you think. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoking flax he shall not quench. But he shall bring forth judgment unto truth. I love this verse right this part right here. It says, he shall not fail. <laughs> Amen. I quoted that on Sunday sermon. He shall not fail. I don't know about you. That gets me excited. He shall not fail. I mean, God, of course, knowing all things, and Jesus Christ, you know, but I ever heard that song, Jesus never fails. Right? We heard that today, right, brother? Remember? <laughs> I don't know. Chuck was singing the whole day. Um, <laughs> Jesus never, he cannot fail. That, that, I don't know about, that gets me excited, right? Why? Because, you know, his first coming, we look back, of course he couldn't fail. He was God. Of course he couldn't fail, you know? And of course he, he was going to carry that cross. He was going to make it to the end. He was going to bear the burden. He, he was going to rise again. Of course he was. But he's coming again. Amen. Right? Yeah, I mean, most of you said amen. He's coming again. <laughs> amen? And uh, uh, it's great. He's coming again. Well, he, he can't fail, you know? It's not like he's going to fight the battle of Armageddon and we're going to be chewing our nails. 
You know, is he going to win? <laughs> you, know, you know, it's not like Rocky, you know. You know, and we all know the movie he's going to win. But, you know, he, he's going to go down and he gets knocked down three times, but he gets back. That's not how Armageddon's fought, okay. <laughs> the Lord comes back. There's never any doubt. You know, he cannot fail. I like that. I like that. I hope you like that, too. It says, uh, he shall not fail nor be discouraged. Think about that. You know, we, we want to paint Jesus as discouraged. <laughs> Till he has set judgment in the earth, and the isle shall wait for his law. Isn't that amazing? I mean, God's saying this years and years and years before Christ comes, and you know, and they understand that he's going to be the servant of the Lord. And he, he is the servant of the Lord. And let's take a look, first of all, to understand the servanthood idea. Um, we must understand, first of all, his, his deity. He's God, okay? And I know you know this. Look at John 1.1. 1, 1. If you can't quote it, quote it. Attempt to quote it. If I started it, could you finish it? In the beginning... Yes, you almost got into sync there towards the end. In the, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, Yes, you, should, you know 14 as well as you know 1, I hope, because those two verses commonly should come to mind. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then the Bible goes on and says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You, you, you need to know those verses if you don't have them memorized. Put them, put them down in your memory bank. And uh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He, the servant of God, the Son of God, became flesh. Look at Mark 1.1. 1, 1. You know John 1.1. 1, 1. What's Mark 1.1? 1, 1? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I like that, you know, because if some people question when the gospel began. <laughs> the beginning, in case you did, you know, the beginning's here, okay? The beginning of the good news, the gospel, amen? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Son of God. He's the Son of God. God. Now you say, I knew that. Well, praise the Lord. Do you know how many people don't? I got a, uh, I got a, a missionary letter today, and a guy wants to come show his work, and he's in the, in the Bible translators. And a uh, good guy, you know, we are uses the Masoretic text and uh, the received text, and uh, maybe we'll have him in, maybe we won't. I don't know. I haven't, uh, haven't decided. He wants to come sometime in October, which would be nice. Uh, so reading through his thing, though, uh, it, it's too... Uh, uh, they specialize in going to people, of course, who don't have the Bible in their language. And I can't quote it to you off the top of my head, but uh, there, there were somewhere, I don't know if it was 5,600 languages or something like that in the world. And there were 1,700 of them have Bibles complete. Another 800 or something have New Testaments. Uh, maybe it was the other way around. I can't remember. And, uh, but literally, over, well over half the languages... There's 3,600 or 3,200 of the languages, known languages in the world, do not have a New Testament or a Bible in their language. And then when I was thinking about that, I was, wow, you know, how lucky am I to know that Jesus is the Son of God? There's only one way you know that, right? Somebody told you or you read it in the Bible, and probably somebody told you who was reading the Bible, <laughs> I mean, what chance do you have if you don't even have a Bible in your name? And there's talking about the reasons to do this. And uh, one of them, well, there's a whole list of them at the end of the page. Very well done. And uh, it says, you know, uh, uh, it enables church planning. You think about it. You're gonna, we, we believe in church planning. You send a missionary to a land. There's no Bible. You want to go plant a church without Bibles, right? I mean, could you get up and preach and not say, open your Bibles, please? <laughs> Can't, right? Wow. I mean, that. how dependent are you on the pastor? And what happened during the Middle Ages when all dependency was on the priest? Right? They fed him all kinds of lies. Right? If you totally had to depend on me to tell you the truth. What? 
You can trust me. God does say tithe to the pastor, 5% above your tithe to the church. Absolutely. No. <laughs> Look at John 149. If you want to have fun in the gospel according to John in chapter number 1, uh, in my old Bible, which I happened to leave at Brandon Anderson's house, I hope he's taking good care of it. <laughs> I told him I'd come back and get it one of these days. John 149. Nathaniel, which is an amazing thing, answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. If you want to have fun in John chapter 1, write down somewhere in the margin of your Bible all the titles for Jesus Christ in John chapter 1. You might be surprised how many are one chapter of the Bible. Uh, he is the Son of God. He is, now look at John chapter 5, verse 8, 18. The Jews uh, did not get this wrong, okay? The Jews did not get this wrong. I was going to say, there must be more to pray for than that. Oh, all right, got the backside. Amen. Thank you, Steve, for getting that quickly. John 5, 18. It says, therefore, the Jews sought the, to, the more to kill him. Now, they're trying to kill Jesus. Of course, later, Jesus says, you try to kill me, and they say, we don't try to kill you. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now, some people say, no, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses, he's the son of God. He's not the same as God. Yeah. He un they understand what it means to be the only begotten son of God, okay? You are not a begotten son of God. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. Generated from the Father. We're adopted. He's generated from the Father. Well, does that mean he was created? No. He's the, the, one of the early creeds said, not made, begotten. There's a difference. He was never created. He's from eternity past. The second person of the Godhead. Which means what? No difference in essence between him and the Father and the Holy Spirit. One in essence. One God. One God in multiplicity. One God in multiplicity. You say, well, that doesn't make any sense. How can you have one that's multiple? One classroom. How many students in it? Could be one, could be 50. One class, right? That's singular in multiplicity. We use the same term. We do use it the same exact way all the time, right? Right? One church. That's the people, right? One jury. That's 14, right? We use it the same way all the time. So don't get confused about language, okay? It's pretty simple. God, Jesus Christ, making himself out to be the Son of God. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. You all say we're studying the deity of Christ? Yeah. This is a great verse, Colossians 2.9. You say, well, is there bad verses? <laughs> well, there's some verses I don't like, right? Doesn't make them bad. <laughs> Colossians 2.9, you got it? For in him, that's in Jesus Christ, dwelleth the fullness of of the Godhead bodily. Ain't no way around it. What does that mean? This is how you read your Bible, right? What does that mean? In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now look at the next verse. And ye are complete in him. So does that mean I have no need of God? If I am complete in something other than God, if I'm complete in Michael the archangel, you know, some groups say he's the archangel. I'm complete in him. Well, then I don't need anything else. I mean, just think about what that's saying. And ye are complete in him. 
which is the head of all principality and power. What does that mean? I, I don't know how to take that any other way. I mean, if, if I was somebody and I started a cult, um, I, I, I changed that in my Bible. I think they did. <laughs> Pretty sure. Take a look at chapter 1. Verse 16. Now, if you want to look at verse 15, listen, this is, this is a verse they like to take out of context and say, see, see, he's created, who is the image of the invisible God. He's just the image. Well, Hebrews chapter 1 says he's the express image. The express image. And there it's, it uses it in a Greek form of, of the nature of God, the exact same nature as God, the expressed image. You want to know who God is? You've got to know who Jesus is. When you know who Jesus is, you know who God is. If you know Jesus' character, his long-suffering, you know his gentleness, if you know his kindness, if, if, if you know what bothers Jesus, you know what bothers God. Tell me something that bothered Jesus. I mean, all Jesus ever does is hug people, right? He's never upset about anything. He never gets upset about anything. All he ever does is hug people. He loves everybody, and he just, he, you'll never see Jesus ever use any kind of physical violence ever, right? Yes, we were studying this, right? What was that? Right, he made a whip, right? And he just sat there going, all right, boys, you better get out of here or else. Even that would be kind of threatening, right? It said he drove them out from the Gentile court because everybody was supposed to have a place in that temple. And they said, oh, no, no, we're, the Gentiles are dogs. Let's just fill up their room with a bunch of garbage, you know, and we'll keep our room clean. They filled the Gentile court. Jesus says, my house shall be a house. My father's house shall be a house of prayer to all nations. Don't you dare take the Gentile court and turn it into an animal stall. That's what they did. So what do you do? What do you say to Matthew 23? I would love to preach that sermon to some of you. You hypocrite. You have viper. <laughs> I mean, seven times a hypocrite, three times a viper. That, that's a pretty tough sermon to preach to a, to a group of religious men. Remember that one funeral? I'll never forget that one funeral. I had, had, a, had a, a homosexual couple in the front. And uh, I think there was two, if I remember right. And then um, there was a Jehovah Witness, and I can't remember. There was some other member there from a, from a, a, a cult, and they were saying, and you know, they were all sitting there. And then uh, um, then a, another preacher came in from another church, uh, it wasn't our denomination or something. It was there, and it was wild. And I'm sitting there, and it was like, and then as I begin this the funeral, wedding funeral, same thing, um, a priest walks in and sits down. Wow, what an opportunity to share the gospel, you know? What a great opportunity. And uh, that, I think that was the, the funeral when uh, Brittany Anishanis was sitting in the front row. And she got mad at me and hated my guts. <laughs> That's what she said And uh, when she left. She was under such conviction when she left. I think it was her aunt's funeral. I think that was the one. And uh, um, when she left, then later she got saved, and God just did a wonderful work. That was awesome. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. It says, he, well, I'm sorry, it says he's, a, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. They like to use that and say, see, he's the firstborn. You understand firstborn is not order there, it's title. Okay? Of all things created, who's first in importance? Jesus. Okay? As, the, as a creature, as a man, he's the first, okay? He's, he's greater than Adam. He's greater than all other men. He gets the double portion. He's the firstborn. It's not about order there. Um, but it says, for by him were all things created. Now, you're going to have trouble with that when you read the, 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 the gospel of Isaiah. You could call it that. Because over and over and over, God's going to say, I created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. He's going to say that, I think, three times in Isaiah 40, chapters 40 through 50. He, he, he created everything in it. You know what the false teachers teach, right? That God created the universe, time, space, and matter, and perhaps the earth, and then created Jesus, and then through him created everything. 
So Jesus is the first thing created, and through Jesus, then, God created everything. And that's just, it, it, it's an it's a odd philosophy. They do the same thing with Mary. So I, I talked to him before. You think Mary can hear millions of prayers simultaneously, and she can distinguish between all of them, whether they're real or not, whether it's a genuine heart or not. Doesn't that make her omniscient? And doesn't that make her um, omnipresent? And they said, well, no, God could grant that to her. And listen, that's, that, that's, I, I know you could say that's not unlimited. It's, it, it would only be maybe, be maybe 25 or 30 or 50 million people at once in the Eastern time zone that are all having mass. Maybe it's 50 or 100 million people. It's not infinite. But listen, if you can read 100 million minds simultaneously and hear their prayers simultaneously and then work out a way to answer them simultaneously, that's omnipresence, omnipotence, uh, and that's omniscience. I mean, 100 million simultaneously. And God cannot share his attributes. He cannot share that, that, those attributes. He can't share omnipotence. That's something God can't communicate to us. Some of his attributes he can't communicate, but those, those, those things, that his essence, that he can't communicate that to us. Okay, And that's, that's uncommunicable, if you want to say it that way. It says, for by him were all things created. How do you say that about Jesus Christ? He's God. He's God. He's God from the beginning. By all things were created that are in heaven, so he made all the angels. So how do you think it's going to be when Jesus fights Satan? He's fighting his creator. Not much of a battle, is it? Matter of fact, it's funny because like when the Antichrist or, or Satan, it says a strong angel came down, bound him, and threw him into... Jesus doesn't even do the dirty work. He just sends a strong angel and throws Satan in the bottomless pit. Who's that strong angel that, that, that manhandles Lucifer? I don't know. I want to meet him, though. <laughs> For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. You mean there's invisible things created? Well, yeah, we made telescopes so we can see them, right? Or is he referring to spiritual things? Both, right? Hope the heat didn't come back on. Both, visible and invisible. The Bible says uh, in Hebrews that the things that are made, were, uh, things that were created were made with th by things that are not seen. I, I can't quote the verse. It's Hebrews uh, Things which are seen are not made by things which do appear. Thank you. And that, uh, yes, that's right. Now it's coming to me. I mean, there's things that you can't see that everything is made out of. Isn't that neat? And I'm going to fix that one of these days. The heat came back on. It's just a pipe expanding inside that wall. So Jesus Christ is God, okay? So now when you go to Isaiah and you read the servant of the Lord, how does the second person of the Trinity become God's servant? Now that is a different role, right? That is a different idea, right? You're my son. Now, I could hire a servant. Now in this land in America, you know, we don't really have servants. But we all understand what a servant is, right? And um, a servant generally is not the idea of somebody you hired, although it could be. But the idea generally would be of a slave almost type, right? You do my bidding, right? And even if you hire somebody, it's hard to have somebody just to do your bidding, right? But now, if I said my son is my servant, you know, it's kind of strange, isn't it? You better hope you got a nice dad. Uh -huh. And uh, how does Jesus Christ become the servant? Somebody tell me. It's a quiet castle. Front row cannot say anything. How does, how does the son become the servant? Where? Chapter. Kessels are going. That's cheating. Philippians chapter 2. 
You memorize it today. So gr praise the Lord. You put those verses to memory. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. So as Jesus, the servant of God, he's, he's God's servant. He comes to earth to serve God, okay? Which is kind of neat because we'll read in a few minutes that he serves man. Now, you all understand that, right? Gabe, go serve God right now. Wow. Serve God. I mean, what are you going to do for God, right? It's almost impossible to serve God without serving God's people. I mean, how do you serve God? Well, I read my Bible. No, that's for you. <laughs> well, I pray. Well, then don't ask for nothing for yourself. Right? I mean, really, prayers for us and for others and for God, and we want to. But what do you do for God? Well, I, well, I give him my money. Really? <laughs> it is an offering unto the Lord. It's serious, right? But it's spent on electric bills and stuff, and sometimes floor scrubbing. Right? It's not actually given to God. And God wouldn't want it, right? It says. United States of America on it. Man, give it to Caesar. What do you do for God? There's very few, few things. We can praise the Lord. We can bless the Lord, right? And, uh, um, and we sacrifice. But whenever we sacrifice, it's serving God's people. If you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to serve God's people. So what do you think Jesus did? Right? He served God's people. He set us an example for what it means to be the servant of God. You know that's one of the greatest titles in the Bible? What was Moses' title? Moses, the servant of the Lord. Matter of fact, there's several people the Bible calls the servant of the Lord in the narrative. What a, what a title. Do you hope to have that, brother? Pete, the servant of the Lord. Right? I mean, that, that's a good title, isn't it? Why? Well, it's, it's better than the servant of Dan, right? Or Martha. Right? <laughs> right? Why? Because he's the Lord. I mean, I mean, if you want to be my servant, and you told somebody, well, I'm the servant of Dan Mills, they'd be like, who? <laughs> who? But if you, if I'm, the, you know, it'd be great to, you know, work for the president, you know, or maybe you're, you're like a, just a staffer, you know, you're just a staffer, but you're a senator staffer, you know? Hey, that, that'd be kind of important, you know? But if you work for the president, you know, and you're, even if you're just, you know, if, if I had to clean somebody's house for a living, he said, what do you do for a living? Well, oh, I, clean, I clean houses. Oh, yeah? Well, that's cool. How many counts you got? One. Really? It's the White House. <laughs> yeah, I'm covered by the Secret Service, got all my clearances. <laughs> You'd be like, you clean the White House? Yeah, that's part of my job. I'm, I'm on staff there. I'm actually in charge of the staff. Wow. Well, all of a sudden, that's a lot more than a house cleaner, right? Why? Because of who you're working for. I'm the servant of the Lord. Is there, a, is there a more prestigious place to be in? Prestigious? Is, is there anything better? I am God's servant. Wow. You know, well, I'm still a servant. That's well, because you just want to serve yourself. Guess what? You're still a servant. The servant of the Lord. Look at uh, Philippians 2, verse 5. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the same as God, the second of the Trinity of God, not meaning any less in power or any less than the first, but just order because God is a God of order. There's a first, second, and third. So how does the second person of the Trinity, who created all things, who is before all things, who, who is in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead, but bodily. Well, God becomes a man, and you know this, but let's put it together, the servant of the Lord. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's a great encouragement, amen? who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, let's stop there for a second. Okay? Um, I believe, if I remember right, um, 
that this part of the Bible is a early Christian creed. If I remember what we just read. And you, and you may want to study that, because I was just talking to Pete about that, something I've been studying lately. And uh, it predates the writing of the Bible, which tells us what the Christians believed from the time Christ ascended until the writing of the Bible. You know, there's a gap there. Uh, 15 or 10 or 15 years to the writing of the, of the Gospels. And, you know, some of Paul's writings you're getting out there, uh, 50s and 60 A.D., well, Christ ascended in 33, so, so you're getting out there 20 years or so before you actually had some of Paul's writings. You know, John, some of his writings are much further out as far as we know, and uh, Peter's writings are out there a little bit in the 60s, I believe. So, I mean, 30 years till Peter's writing. What did they believe for the first 30 years? This tells you. That's, 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 that's neat, okay? What do they believe? That Jesus Christ was God and became a man. They believed that before the New Testament was written. And they believed it from the day Jesus Christ left. It wasn't invented by anybody. It's not a legend or a myth. It was believed the day he left. It was, the, it was believed when he was here, right? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. That means he, he didn't consider the fact that he was God too important for him to become a man. He was, he was willing to set that aside. Now, a lot of people who are high up in order, I mean, why should the pastor clean the toilet? Who am I? I mean, I'm the pastor. Why should I be cleaning the toilet? And some of you are thinking, you're the pastor. Why shouldn't you be cleaning the toilet? <laughs> what, do you really? Do you think, do you think your position puts you above taking care of a problem, right? No. No, absolutely not. Um, you know, and that should be our mindset, right? I mean, you ever walk by something and it's one of your kids' and stuff, and you think, well, who am I to pick it up? I'm dad. I should make my kids pick it up. You yell for one of your kids? Now, sometimes you're trying to teach them a lesson, but if it's just pride, I'm dad. Why should I be doing it? That's, that's not how Jesus thought, and that's what that verse means. And you want to get that in your head. What does that verse mean? Because um, you'll be challenged on it. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made himself. Now, that's a reflexive pronoun. Made himself. The idea of made himself. Right? But made himself. You, you see that? Who did the action? He made himself. Now listen, we, we've got to get our mindset about heaven, okay? Okay, here's heaven. Earth is down there, right? And, and Earth is way below heaven, right? Heaven's a wonderful place. Well, how high is God's throne from heaven? How far above is the uncreated to the created? Infinitely above. God is so far beyond heaven that heaven can't comprehend God. God is uncreated. He's infinite. He cannot be comprehended. He cannot, his mind can't take him in. No angel can comprehend all of God. He's infinite. There's some idea that no angel possibly has ever even seen God. Brother Larson talks about that. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Never thought about it. Got my mind running. Will we be able to see God? Could you see inf infinite, even in your holy state in heaven? Or will God have to man himself, best himself in some way for us to be seen? We don't know, but it says Jesus is going to bring us to the Father and in some way, are we going to see the infinite? I don't know. I, I don't think it's possible, but, you know. So you got to get an idea of how high heaven is. Who is going to humble heaven's throne? All the angels together that ever were created, all of them in one host, can't drag Jesus down. The whole human race crying out, can't reach up and drag him down. All of creation can scream all they want. Jesus does not move off his throne. He's God. There's nobody else that could do it. How do you humble a king? Right? <laughs> you walk in, right, to the president's office and go walk into the Oval Office and say, 
President Trump, I'm bringing you down. <laughs> right? See how quickly you go down. That Secret Service tackles you and drags you out, right? Right? What's that? Nathan, yeah, the prophet did it, right? And, uh, but a little different realm today, amen? How do you bring a king down, right? God does. And we know God brought that king down. If Nathan was wrong, he'd be in trouble. <laughs> but who brings God down? You, you've got to be picky when your scripture. He made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him. Now, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, but it does, you know, I make myself of no reputation. Nobody's going to know who I am. What did Jesus say to everybody after he did the miracles all the time? Don't tell nobody. I like that Chosen series that comes in, and, and, and twice, I think, in the, in the series, the person remarks to Jesus, you do these things? You don't want nobody to know who you are? And they say it like a surprise. And, and remember, his brothers commented on that. Go to Jerusalem and show yourself. You know, that's where all the bigwigs go. Go to Jerusalem and show you. And Jesus says, my time is not, is not, uh, my time is not something. But he says, but your time is always. You know, you know Jesus' timing was by the Father. But if you're not listening to God, you can do whatever you want. You might pay for it. <laughs> but if you're listening to the Father, you've got to obey Him. It says, took upon Him the form of a servant, and took upon Him, that the idea is Himself, He's doing this Himself, the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Now the question is, who made Him? It kind of changes a little bit, and was made. But the whole, idea, the whole performing act here seems to be Jesus Christ. But did He allow this to be made to Him at this point? He was made in the likeness of men. Now, that's an important thing there. He didn't say he was made a man. Remember, he wasn't exactly like us. He had no sin nature. Right? Right? The Holy Spirit was his father. Is there ever another time when God broke the order that somebody shall create after their own kind? It only happened once that something did not create after its own kind. Mary had a baby that wasn't like her. It was of a different nature. Has that ever happened before? You want to you think about this for a minute. I want you to think. All right? Don't look at your Bible. Don't look at your phone. Think. Let your brain work. Has God ever done that at a different time? When? Adam. Adam. God created it, but he said he created it in the image of God, so it would be tough to do. Has God ever since the day he said, and it was before that actually, create after their own kind, has God ever broken that rule? Now evolution says all the time, but we know the truth. If it's not after its own nature, it's destroyed, right? Because that means it's a mutant, and, it, and animals always destroy their, their mutant children, right? And mutants are always lower and missing a leg or blind or something. Has God broken it? Now, what you want to do is you want to understand, no. They always produce after their own kind except for once, and that's a virgin birth. You want to get that in your mind and think about that for a little bit. Why? Because you want to present this to the Muslims, you know. Because they believe in the virgin birth. And you, get to, you have to demand of them an answer. Why was Jesus the only one God ever broke the mold? What is so special that Jesus Christ had to be broken? That mold had to be broken for him. You get, this is where, you know, you, it starts to form. He never, Isaiah wasn't born that way. Jeremiah wasn't born that way. Abraham wasn't born that way. Uh, uh, Adam was created. I mean, it's just a totally different. He never broke that mold except for once in all of world history, and he did it for Jesus Christ. Why? And once you get them on that, because they believe in the virgin birth, once you, well, he was a prophet. He didn't do it for any other prophet. Moses wasn't born that way. 
And as you, as you, as you want to think on that, because that is one of the most, uh, you, you can crown on that and begin the road to the deity of Jesus Christ, right there with the Muslim, right there. And you, and you start on common ground, and you take him right to it. It's a beautiful place. Bill Shuey does that quite often. He taught me that. And, uh, but look what it says in verse 7. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Look at that form of a servant. And being in the fashion of a, uh, as of a man, being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Good uh, definition there of a, of a servant. A good servant's obedient. Even the death of the cross. So we see here that it was Christ making himself the servant of the Lord and then becoming a man. Let me take a look at uh, my verse here in Isaiah because I had some verses written down next to it back in Isaiah 42. He was found in the form of a man. So he made himself a man. Okay? Look at John 4, 32. <clears throat> John 4, 32, Jesus speaking, he says... Uh, but he said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Remember the guys, they, they all went down to get something to eat while Jesus was sitting on the well. And that's just a great sermon to preach, you know. You know? Well, the church is always fellowshipping. Somebody else, Jesus is winning souls to Christ, you know. Um, you know, they're all worried about the meal. <laughs> and, and, and Jesus is worried about somebody's soul. Uh, um, uh, there's a lot, uh, I heard some good preaching on this, you know. Uh, and then they, they, they come back and they're still all worried about Jesus' food. But Jesus is worried about the Lord's work. And boy, does this sound like church today. You know, we're more concerned about the fellowship hall and we're more concerned about what we're going to have for dinner and more than we are about actually winning souls. Right? I mean, the church today is the 12 apostles running out to get lunch and coming back. You know, what about lunch? Lunch? You know, and uh, I think it's a friend of mine, I think it was Bill again that preached that one sermon. It was about uh, uh, where Jesus says, launch out into the deep, but he changes it to lunch. And, uh, you know, and most Baptists hear it that way, you know. Uh, just as things start getting good and they're out a little bit into the shallow water, then they think of lunch. And, uh, no, no, Jesus said launch, <laughs> not lunch, all right? And uh, it's, it's kind of comical. Jesus said this, though, let's keep reading there, where he says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore, his disciples, uh, therefore said his disciples one to another, have any man brought him aught to eat? <laughs> and, uh. I, I tell you what, it just, uh, I was thinking today as I was studying where the Bible says, you know, the Bible talks about false teachers, says their God is their belly. And I know that's referring to more than just food, but God also says if he doesn't work, he doesn't eat. And uh, from a couple of other passages, we find, if that one is particularly one of the main ones, that the greatest motivator for he, mankind is their belly. When you can't eat, there's almost nothing you won't do. And then I was thought about that in Isaiah when the Bible talks about if they're thirsty, if they're hungry, I will, I will not forget them. And, uh, and I got to thinking about how hunger is the greatest motivator. And as I was reading through the Bible, I came to several passages on people that were hungry and, um, and how they, 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 it caused them to strive and it caused them to do things. And I thought, what if hunger comes to America? You know, some people are stocking up. You know, afraid that something might happen. Our chain, the supply chain might have a, have a break in it once this thing is over because production is going to take a while to kick back up again or whatever. Um, what if we get hungry? And there's a motive there. I mean, just think on that for a little bit as you're studying your Bible. It's good today. But there, look at, uh, we keep reading. It says, you know, they're always thinking about food. And Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Notice the servanthood. I'm here to finish his work. You all know in Luke there when Jesus got lost, right? Well, wait a minute, did he? You ever wonder how you lose Jesus? I mean, don't you feel bad? I mean, can you imagine you get to heaven and you're talking to to Joseph and Mary, and it's like, did you really lose Jesus? 
Tell me the whole story. Was it a big caravan? Was there that many of you and that you really didn't notice? You, was he with, supposed to be with his uncle or, or what were you thinking? I mean, you lost Jesus. <laughs> I mean, oh, I hope you haven't lost Jesus for three days. Have you ever done it? I sure have. You know, you get a little overwhelmed you get a, and you just forget about the Lord and uh, they forgot Jesus. But what was Jesus doing? He was about his father's business. Remember, that was a rebuke to Mary, because Mary says, you know, uh, your father and I. And Jesus says, you know, I should be about my father's business. But if you ever want to know if you have a, have a false Bible, read the NIV, and it says in that passage in verse 33 of chapter 2 of Luke, it says that his father and mother, making Joseph his father in the narrative, meaning there's an error in your Bible, in the narrative, meaning your Bible is not perfect because it's a narrative. The Holy Ghost said that Joseph was Jesus, his father. And boy, I tell you what, and Jesus, right in the very same passage, passage says, that's not my father. He says that to Mary. You wonder why Jesus says it that way? No, you're not. I, ought to be, uh, I, ought, I should be or ought to be about my, my father's business. When Mary just said, your father and I were looking for you? See, that's not narrative. That's Mary speaking. And uh, your father and I were looking for you. Jesus says, no, 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 I'm about my father's business. You know? And that's, but you notice the servanthood. The servanthood. Uh, the great servants. Um, this is something uh, uh, our children should understand that, right? They are the servants of their parents until they're of age and they leave the house, right? And they should serve with a willing heart, Right? That's a good test of, of to see what kind of a kid they are. Jesus Christ, though, notice he was about his father's business. Why? He's God. He's God in the flesh, humbling himself to be in the form of a servant. That's important to get. Jesus himself made himself in the form of the servant. The only reason you won't serve is because you don't want to. No, I had a good excuse. <laughs> like I said before, if you run out of excuses, let me know. I got a whole drawer full of them. All right? The only reason you don't serve your parents is because you don't want to. The only reason you don't serve your spouse is because you don't want to. I, oh, rah, rah. Right? That's why you don't. Jesus made himself. This is the whole point we're getting to. Well, Jesus is my example. He's my Lord. Jesus says, if I'm your Lord, why don't you do the things I say? Why don't you follow my example? I've left you an example that you should follow this. I humbled myself. I became a servant. Huh. I don't like application. Okay, let's just stick to this. Um, let me give you a couple more verses here. You say, well, uh, I know these. Yeah, but we need to remind it. Look at uh, chapter 4, verse 9 of John. 9-4? Did I say 9-4 or 4-9? Go to, yeah, 9-4. 9-4. <clears throat> There's many of these in John. John particularly focuses on this, which is amazing, because John's, you know, gospel is about the Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, God in the flesh, you know. He's, he's God, but yet he focuses so much on the fact that Jesus came to do something, his Father's will. And everything Jesus did, he said, the words I speak, the works I do, they're all from the Father. I do them not of myself. Look at verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me. If we all had that attitude, wouldn't that be something? I must work the works of God that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. I must work the works of him that sent me. Wow, that's, that's different, isn't it? What's your purpose in this world? What is your purpose? You know, it's, it's more, it's, God has a purpose for you. That's the most important thing to accomplish, what God has for you. Everything else is a sideline. What does God have for you? And this is where, you know, the, you know rightly so, the, the society we live in, a lot of times says family is the most important thing. And they're right. God gave you a family, made you a mom, a dad, or a brother, or a sister. And that's, family is important because that's what God gave you to do. Right? And that's, you know, supporting your family is important. Why? Because that's what God gave you to do. Right? Your church is important. God gave it for you to do. 
I've never read of entertainment in my scriptures. I can't find it. Let me know when you find the verse on entertainment and how much time we're supposed to spend on entertainment. Because I'm, I'm just struggling with that. I mean, having fun is important, right? But it doesn't seem very important to God. I can't find anywhere or any verse that talks about it. I see some examples where you get rest. And maybe, you know, playing a game can be rest to your mind. I, I agree with that. But I can't find anywhere in my Bible where it talks about anybody playing except for children. And it says children play, so I guess we're supposed to let the kids play. I don't know. So why don't you help me with that? But we must be about what God wants us to do. Well, when? I don't know. Jesus started at 12. When are you going to start? Well, when I grow up, you're 48. Come on, man. <laughs> when are you going to grow up? Right? <laughs> someday I'll be a soul winner. No, you're going to be dead before you're a soul winner. Because someday never comes. It never comes. Look at, look at uh, uh, John. <laughs> you guys are mean. Um, uh, look at John 17, 4. Remember what Jesus said? I must be about the work of my Father. I must finish the work that God sent me to do. I must finish it, man. I've got to get it done. Do any of you feel that kind of pressure? I've got to get it done. I've got to finish what God wants me to do. Why? Because you're going to die. Right? You ever do something so slow that you know you're going to be dead before you ever get done? I'm thinking about that men's room. I will be dead before that men's room is done. At the pace, at the pace we're working on it, that's right, I will be dead. And uh, <laughs> there's no doubt, right? And uh, there's, there's some things you work on kind of slow and you'll be dead. And I remember saying that to people. And I'm getting there and you're like, you'll be dead before you get there, okay? You're ta oh, baby steps, you know, you don't want to go too fast. No, 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 listen. At those steps, you'll be dead before you get there, okay? You can't take baby steps in, in this, okay? We run a race. You must be about your father's business. Why? Because you're going to die. When? You don't know. But Jesus had something. Jesus, okay, let's say Jesus, he had a little bit of insight maybe that we did. He knew he was going to die soon. When he said that back there in John chapter 4, he knew he was going to die soon, Right? I think if I remember right, the, the Samaritan there, he was well past halfway through his ministry, had his face set as he'd go to Jerusalem, and he's heading up that way. Um, you know, let's say it's two and a half years. He's got a year left before he dies. I don't know if that's true, but let's just say it is. Okay? And so he's kind of got an idea that he doesn't have much longer to live. I mean, you've got a lot longer to live. How much longer are you going to live, Steve? Right, three, four weeks. Right? So you've know, you got less than Jesus. Right? I must be about my father's business. You know, you hear a lot of this about, if you knew right now that you were going to die in, in 30 days, what would you do the next 30 days? Would you go to work? <laughs> I don't know if you got enough money to last 30 days or not. I don't know. What would you do for the next 30 days? Who would you tell about the Lord? Who would you try to get busy for, for God to get it done? Well, that's the kind of incentive Jesus had. Look what he said, though, in John chapter 17. And, uh, Verse number four, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Wouldn't you like to say that? I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. Uh, I came in third place. And uh, I ran, man, I ran well over 50% of my race. Would <laughs> you say that at the end of your life? I got 50% done. Well, it's not my fault I died young. And God says, no. No, you just ran the wrong pace. You ran the wrong pace. Well, you know, oh God, I was working every day. I, 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 I said, work while it is light. Are there not 12 hours in a day? Work while it is day. So I set the standard at 12 hours a day. Some of you are like, I work about 16. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. You're a little ahead of the game. You get four hours off. You ever think about that? When Jesus said there's 12 hours in a day, work while it's day. You can't complain until the 12th hour because he said, until you've done what you ought to do, you're still an unprofitable servant. You should go beyond. 
You see, the trouble isn't that we're not getting things done for the Lord. The trouble is the pace we're getting them done. We're going to be dead long before they get done. Jesus knew he had a time. He focused, I must work my Father's works, and he did. And guess what he said at the end? I finished the work that God gave me to do. Now, there's several things he had to do. Present himself as Messiah. He had to, get the, he had to do the miracles to prove his deity. Um, he, he had to get rejected and show himself as the Lamb of God. I mean, there's many things that, that Jesus had to do when he came, many of the works that Jesus had to perform. Uh, you can go through that list. I have written in my other Bible. But uh, Jesus finished the work that God gave him to do. I'm afraid I'm not going to finish God's work. God wants a church in Bradford. There's no doubt in my mind by looking at the history of Bradford Baptist Church, God wants a church in Bradford. And now he connected us with another church that has a longer history here in Bradford. And God began it in 1953, and he worked it up through. God wants a church in Bradford. Are we going to get the job done? Or are we going to be dead before it gets here? That's my concern, is I am not going to get it done. Paul says, I run as to win. You got to put it all in for how long? Till you're dead. Right? And I just can't find entertainment in the Bible. There's got to be playtime somewhere. Please, somebody, somebody help me. There's got to be a time to play. God, does, God lets us play. The servant of the Lord, God finished the work. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 26. So. Jesus was God's servant through and through, all through his heart. When he came to earth, he didn't come, uh, you know, uh, was it Matthew chapter 20? We'll look at that next. What did I say? Acts 3 something? Acts 3, 26? It says, unto you first, God, he's talking to the Jews, has raised up his son Jesus and sent him to bless you, turning every way or away from his iniquities. And there's that, that narrative, his son, Jesus Christ. I, mean, I thought there was a servant that one, but I think that might be changed in the new version to a servant and, and not a son. I think that was on my mind. Let me, let me read this other one here. Um, Hebrews 2.9. And then Hebrews 2.16. Great verses to put together. Hebrews 2.9 and 2.16. You might want to cross-reference them. You might want to draw a line through your Bible and come to the other side. Mine are almost across from each other. It says, but, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Notice, made lower than the angels. Remember it says he was made in the fashion of a man, made lower than the angels. What's that, Psalm chapter 8, I think it is, where it says, uh, thou hast made him lower than the angels. That's a reference to mankind. We're made just a little lower than the angels. Here, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Uh, crowned with, uh, by the, uh, well, let me read it. Crowned with, with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he should ta taste death for just the elect. Did I read that wrong? He should taste death for who? Are you sure it's every man? It's just every man that's part of the group, right? That's what that means. He tasted death for every man that's part of the group, just for the elect. He, 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 he tasted God for those people that he knew he was going to get saved, but he didn't taste death for the people he knew he wasn't going to get saved. I mean, that's clear by that verse. Anyway, look at verse 19. Not verse 19, 16. If you find 19, let me know. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Look, he took on him. And there you have Jesus Christ becoming a man. Oh, by the way, how many natures are there that are intelligent? Huh? There's the human nature. God's nature. Read the verse. The nature of angels. All right? So, he didn't take on angels, and he took on man, then what was he? If he what, what was he? There's only three natures that we know of. Oh, wait a minute, there's aliens. Right? Those, those ones over in Mars. Think about that for a minute. God's, God's talking about the natures here. What nature did he take on? So he took on, he became a man, he became a servant, he did it himself, he made himself. 
He didn't consider the office that he was in. He is the Son of God, but he willingly became the servant of God. Look at Matthew 20, 28, and we're done. I'm in Luke. There we go. Made it. Oh, one more page. Matthew 20, 28. And I'm going to pull a Kessel on you. Let's go back to verse 25. Amen. He taught me. Got to follow the doctor. But Jesus called them unto himself. You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. Now, you know that, right? We're Gentiles, so we understand this. Our princes, or the people who are in charge of us, we elect them, most of them here. Some of them are appointed in our government. But they exercise dominion over us. We have to do what they say, right? For the most part. And they, are great, and they that are great exercise authority on them. That's what we call the great men of our country. They exercise, by the way. That's good to know. But it shall not... But it shall not be so among you. So, here we have as and so, your great ones will not exercise authority over you. Your great ones will not exercise dominion over you. So, who's the great ones here? Who's the great ones? You know what it says about John the Baptist? It says he was great. He, will, he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. How many miracles did he do? None recorded. How long was his ministry? About six months? Six months, goes to jail, gets his head cut off. A few months later. Six-month ministry, never a miracle recorded. We only have a couple of phrases from his prophecies of his preaching. What did Jesus say about John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 11? But I say unto you, of those born among women, there is not a greater than John the Baptist. Wasn't Isaiah born of a woman? Wasn't Moses born of a woman? What about Samuel? Was he born of a woman? You mean John the Baptist was the greatest? He's greater than Samuel, than Moses. He's greater. John the Baptist was the greatest one by way of his station because he was the forerunner of God, which makes him the greatest because of by way of his station. He had an opportunity none of them had to make straight the way of our God in the wilderness. So the greatest among us. But notice, how do you get great in the sight of God? If he was great in the sight of the Lord, John the Baptist must have been a very humble man. Right? Didn't sound like it when he preached, but he was. Great, but it shall, not, it shall not be so among you. That's a command, you guys. That's a command. It shall not be. The greatest ones among you will not exercise authority, will not exercise dominion. You get, you get it in your heart. But whoso will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister. He came as a servant. He humbled himself. He became in the form of a man. Behold, what does God say? Behold, Isaiah 42, 1. Behold, my servant. What has God commanded us to do right there? What's behold mean? It means look upon with scrutiny. I want you to check out, look upon, and examine, move it around, check out the angles, my servant. Check him out. He's equal with me, but made himself my servant. Now, I want you to take that to the feminist. You'll find an absolutely anti-Christ spirit. Take that to politics. You'll find an anti-Christ spirit. Take that out into the world, into the business world. You'll find it, that the Gentiles do not think that way. 
But God said, it shall not be so here. Let's see which one of you can be the greatest servant of all. Let's see who can be the most humble. Let, let's try it out. Let, let's have a competition. Steve likes competition. He's very competitive. We'll see who can, who can be the greatest servant, the most humble, who can serve the most. Be good competition, wouldn't it? If we all had that attitude, what would the church be like? You know, nobody would ever make a decision. <laughs> it's not, well, whatever you say. We do hear a lot in church, don't we? It's up to you. Whatever you want is fine with me. That's a great thing to hear, isn't it? Right? Until you have five people saying it. Right? Somebody's got to say, well, how about red? No, I hate red. <laughs> no, you got to really mean it, right? you got to really mean it. Let's go to the Lord. Let's pray, and we'll close the service. Father, thank you, Lord, for the chance to be in church tonight, Lord. Thank you for being a servant. God, forgive me. My heart is not always right with God. I do not have that servant heart that I desire. And I failed, Lord, often at leading this church with a, with a servant's heart. So, God, thank you for mercy. God, I pray that you'd forgive that sin. And, God, for the rest of our church, God, would you have mercy upon us. And, Lord, we do want to let that mind be in us, in us that was in Christ Jesus. But, Lord, nobody here is going to humble me but me. So, Father, as Christ humbled himself, may we do the same. May we be found in the servant, as in the form of a servant, Lord. Thank you for letting us behold thy servant tonight. We're going to go. We're going to pray for a few minutes. I ask your blessing, Lord, tonight upon our prayer time. I pray for fellow, fellow churches, God, that are out there tonight that are meeting, uh, that you bless them. I pray for my wife and daughter, Lord, as they're uh, far away, my daughters and my, my grandson, that you protect them, Lord, and keep us safe. Lord, I pray for, once again, our, our loved ones here at this church. God, I pray for Grandpa, and I pray for Jody, Lord, and Brother Vinka, and for Brother Chuck, and others, Lord, uh, uh, Abby, I think of her, and Mrs. Vinka. Uh, Lord, folks that might be susceptible to this coronavirus, Lord, uh, um, would you protect them, please? Strengthen their lungs, strengthen their bodies. If the coronavirus comes, Lord, if you could just keep it from us, I pray for a cure. Once again, God, I ask you to, to bless those doctors who are working hard and overtime, and the laboratories trying to come up with something for us. Lord, would you, would you help them to happen upon it very quickly? And, Lord, uh, yeah, the FDA, maybe they're working on some of these things, God. And, and thank you, Lord, as they're, they're bypassing laws and trying to push things through as fast as they can. Thank you for a land like that. Now, Lord, I pray that you keep us uh, from that great tragedy, Lord. He's talking about 100,000 people in America dying, possibly 200,000. Oh, Father, uh, my heart goes out for that, Lord, that you would avoid that, that you would stop that. And, God, may it be far less than what they consider. One is too many because it's somebody somebody loves. Lord, I ask you to turn the hearts back to God through this. I pray that there might be a percentage of America that, that sees the helplessness of man and they may search out the God of heaven, Lord. I pray that you might be glorified in this. And, Lord, uh, I pray you might give us courage to speak to the world. And, uh, God, guide this church. Should we, should we gather this Sunday or not? We have the freedom to do that, Lord, uh, but give us wisdom whether we should or not. We do not want to endanger those we love. We don't want to lose anybody, anybody in this church. So, Father, I, I ask you for wisdom in that. In Jesus' name, amen.